see you a lot of very examples. familiar faces. Uh, I was surprised at the turnout. You said that we never know when you start planning these type of things about how many people would actually be interested in coming. So I'm a little bit shocked to talk in front of as many people and everything too. So I'll try to do my best and not stutter too much. But uh, most of you know me, I'm Billy Lee. So I am the uh, t uh, appointed, self not self appointed, but the appointed uh, vice president of the Chinese Historical Society. And we're so pleased that uh, we're invited to have distinguished author this afternoon, Dr. John Jung. I know most of you have seen him or heard his lectures or read some of his books. I've gathered some of the books from his, that he's written in the past. They're not in any order right now, but um, Dr. John was <coughs> born in Macon, Georgia, and uh, he lived until he was about 15 years of age. And then he moved to San Francisco <coughs> with his family. He got his uh, I guess it's kind of the beginning of his college education, and then he went and got his doctorate at uh, Northwestern University. And uh, he was a professor for psychology for nearly 40 years. And then he decided he wanted to have a second career, and uh, so he became a historian. So he's written a number of different books. I've gathered some of them from the back. So he's written Southern Pride Rise. He's he actually gotten, a, I guess, a, a growing interest in the Chinese history and about especially the Chinese growing up here in the Delta region. So we're just so pleased to have him come here. And uh, I guess the book that he started, I guess, was a, a Chinese American Odyssey where how he just kind of rediscovered himself as, a, as an author. And then he's also written, I think it's, this is his latest book, Chopsticks in the Land of the South, in the Land of the Cotton. I'm sorry, I can't read today. And one of his earlier books, Chinese Laundries, Tickets to Survival in the uh, uh, Gold on Gold Mountain. And then and when the sweet and sour a life in the Chinese family restaurant. So uh, if you would join me in welcoming Dr. John and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that nice introduction and thank you all for coming out. It's good to uh, have an audience, I guess. I'm retired professors, you know, we always are looking for audiences. You know, we used to have captive audiences in our classes, you know, but you're all here on a volunteer basis, so that makes it even better. Um, yes, um, thank you so much for inviting me to come down and give this talk. I, I haven't been in the South, I uh, lived in the South for many, many years, but I still feel a connection to the South, although I had never actually been in Mississippi until probably 10 or 15 years ago. So my own personal experience um, was in Georgia. So I guess that gives me some credentials to say something about Chinese in the South as a whole in terms of their history. So what I'm going to do a little bit is talk about my own personal connection. And then I'm going to lead into how this all connects to Memphis and also to the Delta. So it's like almost like a three talks for the price of one. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, so growing up in Macon, Georgia, my family, we were the only Chinese in the whole town. So I didn't really know where I stood. You know, am I black? Am I white? What am I? You know, I'm Chinese. I knew I was Chinese because we were different. We ate Chinese food. My parents we were immigrants. They spoke Chinese. But I really didn't exactly know what it meant to be Chinese because there were no other Chinese people around. Next. In fact, uh, the only image I got in media, if you want to call comic books media, was in this uh, sort of like Magnificent Seven precursor called Black Hawk. And Black Hawk, there were seven uh, fighters for justice. They went around and got rid of bad people. And they had one Chinese character, Chop Chop. He was my, I won't say he's my role model, but he's the only Asian character I ever saw as I grew up, because I didn't know anything about Fu Manchu or Charlie Chan, because this was before the days of the internet and being in Georgia, you know, there wouldn't be any market for that. So Chop Chop was like comic relief. Uh, Black Hawk's members, they all had uh, guns. Chop Chop had his meat cleaver, okay? That's how he exacted uh, justice. Okay, so these were not exactly positive feelings I had about what it meant to be Chinese. Uh, next. So as I thought about it later, you know, because as a child, I didn't really care that much to even know any history, much less Chinese American history. And 
We really didn't learn anything in our books about Chinese American history. Actually, zero, zilch, okay? So, uh, next. Uh, if there was anything that was mentioned, it was that the Chinese contributed to the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, which was a major, major achievement for the country because it united uh, the country from coast to coast and uh, really affected the settlement of the West to a large degree. Uh, yeah, I know you can't read in the back because I didn't realize that the screen would not be big enough to accommodate people in the back. This is just a, well, I hate to say it, a laundry list of laws against Chinese, but okay, we'll use that time if you pardon it. Uh, Chinese were prevented various things uh, like laws against them. They couldn't vote. Uh, there's laws against intermarriage for many, many years. Uh, there were laws against various Chinese customs, so like laundrymen in big cities, they would carry uh, poles across their back where they'd have a basket on either end. So they passed a law saying you, you couldn't do that. Uh, there were uh, taxes called the foreign miners tax, so Chinese who came over in the 18, late 1840s to, to find gold to, to mine, they had to pay a tax on what they uh, obtained. So there were a lot of in other words, prejudices and biases against Chinese, certainly uh, in the mid-1800s and moving forward for quite a while. Uh, next slide. So ultimately, the real, the real big one was the Chinese Exclusion Act that I'm sure most of you have heard of, 1882. Uh, there have been movements toward this for some time. It, took, you know, it wasn't an overnight decision. But finally, in 1882, uh, Congress actually passed a Chinese Exclusion Act, which basically said if you were a laborer of Chinese background, you could not come to this country. And it was the only law that was passed that was exclusively against one uh, national group. Now, what was the impetus for this? Well, part of it was racism, to be sure, but also part of it was economic, because uh, the Chinese were... Uh, either able or willing or uh, had no choice but to work for lower wages. And that's how they got jobs in various areas. And so in 1873, there was a big recession in the United States. And so this made it even more uh, of a problem in terms of the treatment of the Chinese because they were seen as cheap labor taking jobs away from white people. Now, I, there's a bit of irony in this, uh, you say, uh, Chinese then resorted to various illegal means of entry, such as false documents, so-called paper signs, where someone would buy the documents of another person, and they would come in memorizing uh, demographic and biographical information about the person they alleged to be. So why do I call this some irony, okay? Why were there so many Chinese here in the first place? Well, we go back to the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. They recruited Chinese who were uh, in California who had, uh, were no longer uh, working in the mines, and then they couldn't find enough Chinese to work on the railroad. And so they, could, they actually went back labor contractors to China to bring somewhere around 20,000 Chinese over. So in repayment to the Chinese for helping them build the railroad, they said, oh, now, 1869, the railroad was completed. We're, we just celebrated the 150th anniversary of that. So suddenly, you got all these Chinese who came over to help build the railroad. They're all out of work. So what are they going to do? They're going to, you know, bid for the lowest price to get certain work. And so that created this backlash against the Chinese, which eventually led to the Exclusion Act, which was not officially repealed until 1943 even though even then there was still a lot of problems. All right, so moving forward, these are just some documents that I discovered of, about my parents' immigration. I didn't discover these until after my parents had passed on. I wish I had found them earlier because there were a lot of questions uh, that I would have loved to have asked them. So this is just, I, I know you can't read, at least you can see my father's image. Uh, I found these in the San Bruno, California National Archives. 75 to 100 pages, single space, typed on onion skin. And those documents were almost 100 years old. 
So if you want your documents to be well preserved, use onion skin. <laughs> All right, now, next slide is a, something from my mother. Now, maybe you can read this a little bit better. The questions that they asked a lot of women, and this is of my mother, was basically issues of moral uh, things like, do you believe that you can be married to two people at the same time? Uh, basically questions like, are you or have you ever been or will you ever be a prostitute? Questions of that nature that they didn't really ask the men. Uh, have you ever been arrested? Have you ever been supported by charity? So those are the concerns uh, of the questions for women. All right, next. Uh, now, that's a picture of my laundry, my parents' laundry in the middle of the block as it appeared in 1953. And as I found out later when I started doing research for the book that was the memoir of my family, the one that was called Southern Fried Rice, I discovered uh, that the laundry had been there on that picture postcard in 1906. It looked totally different to me. It was a total shock to me to get that picture. But that was something that really motivated me to dig deeper in this. And then, lo and behold, I found that that building that shown in the postcard in 1906 had been there at least as early as 1885, and it had also been a Chinese laundry in 1885. And all those laundries kept the same name, Samley Laundry, uh, because the Chinese were thrifty. They didn't want to paint another sign, okay? <laughs> Keep the same sign for 75 years. And by the way, <laughs> A lot of customers thought my father's name was Sam. But see, Sam Lee is not a person. Sam Lee is a Chinese concept of wishful thinking. In this case, triple profits. The laundry was called triple profits laundry, okay? <laughs> a lot of other Chinese laundries had these other fantasies of, you know, uh, making money. Uh, next slide. Okay, now, I also found this, uh, you know, when I started doing my book with the help of a librarian, we have to all thank librarians for all they do for us, yeah. found this article about this girl in Macon, Georgia, who was denied admission to a white school. Her name happened to be Mei Ling Soon. I don't know if any, that name's familiar to any of you, but the next slide will illustrate who she was. Mei Ling Soon was the future Madame Chiang Kai-shek. So, we kicked her out of school in uh, 1910 when she was in Macon, Georgia. And in 1943, we bring her back and give her an honorary doctorate from Wesleyan College. <laughs> and we whip out four little Chinese kids, the only Chinese kids in town, as a photo op. But my sister later told me, no, we never got within 100 yards of the famous lady. <laughs> but we made good news articles. Now, I know you're saying, well, what in the hell was she doing in Macon, Georgia? Why would she go there? Well, it turns out that uh, the parents, okay, the father of the, the Soong sisters, the three Soong sisters, arguably the most powerful, famous women of their time. One of them married Sun Yat-sen, one of them married Chiang Kai-shek, and the other one married the Minister of Finance or something. They were there because their father, who had come over a generation earlier, he had studied in Tennessee, in Nashville, which uh, had a divinity school, and later, I think, became Vanderbilt. So anyway, he went back to China and made a fortune selling Bibles. But he decided at one point in time that he wanted to send his daughters to the United States. And he knew a missionary in Macon, Georgia. And so that's the strange quirk of how they ended up in Macon, Georgia. So anyway, uh, yeah, the newspaper article said, big day for tiny junks by our picture it next. So again, these discoveries, you know, every time you dig, you find something new. I didn't know this at the time, but uh, I knew that all the Chinese people I knew were men virtually outside my family. And they, all of them, in, in, the, in Georgia at least, ran laundries. And I was too naive to think, how odd, why is they all running laundries? Why don't they do different things? Well, there's you know, a historical reason for why they only did laundries, because um, they were denied access to more lucrative jobs. Nobody likes to do laundry, so let the Chinese do the laundry, okay? So the Chinese were, uh, with you know, minimal education or technical skills, were able to do that. And so I found that in Georgia and in uh, Tennessee, up in Chattanooga, 
and a couple of places in Alabama, mostly around Birmingham, Talladega, that were all these relatives of my father, clan in China. They, they were there, they all got there by chain migration, and they all ended up doing laundries. Next. So once I went back to Macon with my wife, uh, it's probably 15 years ago, maybe, well, maybe even 20 years ago, and I found the laundry again. You see on the left, the laundry, Sammy Laundry. And when we went to look at it, I wanted to show my wife where the laundry was. It was gone. And I'm standing right in front of where the laundry would have been, and there's a church behind it. And I said to myself, they have erased us from history. <laughs> it's as if we never existed. So I was mad. I was mad as hell. And so I said, I have to write this story to prove that there were Chinese people in this place at, at that time. So I, I guess I'm an advocate for historic preservation. Not to say that was the most famous place, but it had been a laundry since 1885. So, you know, give it credit. Okay, next. So this is an interesting uh, item in a, in a laundry journal. When I say laundry journal, like a trade journal, uh, something to be mailed out to people in the laundry business. And someone made this very astute observation, I guess that everyone kind of knew, but no one wanted to know. They said, you know, there are no laundries in China, or at least no laundrymen. In China, the women do the laundry, not the men. So you get all these guys coming over as immigrants to the United States, and they're all opening laundries. What's going on here? They don't know how to do laundry, but no one else wanted to do the laundry, and Chinese couldn't find anything else to do in the late 1800s, for the most part. Uh, well, you know, some of them became farmers and, and miners, but still one of the leading occupations uh, was laundries. And so they point out that this, this uh, unusual paradox without ex exactly explaining why, but makes that point. Next. So I don't know if uh, you can play that audio or try it and see. So these are some dramatic illustrations and not exaggerations by any means of how the Chinese were treated, not only laundrymen, but other people in, in Chinatowns throughout the United States. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so if we go back to, uh, say, 1869, which is 150 years ago, we have some interesting things happen. We already talked about the Transcontinental Railroad. It was finished in 1869, right? So we have all these unemployed laundrymen, I mean, uh, sorry, <laughs> railroad workers. What are they going to do? Well, it coincides with the fact that in uh, the South, in, in this part of the country, uh, slaves have been freed in the 1865 or thereabouts. And so there was starting to be this crisis of where are we going to find labor to work out in the cotton plantations? So someone, a, a Dutch labor contractor working in the United States, got this bright idea. Well, you've got all these uh, uh, Chinese who are unemployed. Uh, maybe we can recruit them to replace the slaves uh, as cheap labor in the cotton fields. So in 1869, there was a Memphis Cotton Growers, Cotton Planters uh, Convention. And a proposal was made, which actually never really got implemented. But the idea was uh, raised to bring Chinese to the South, to the to Mid South, specifically this convention that was held here in Memphis. Okay, uh, so I, I know you can't read this here, but um, this is some newspaper articles from the uh, Memphis newspaper in the late uh, in the mid to late uh, 1800s, which talked about. Uh, the resolution uh, that was made, let's uh, bring several hundred Chinese and try them out and see if they'll work out. That was the plan. So a proposal was made, like what the contract would look like, how much they would pay, how many hours they would work, and that sort of thing. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a sort of, a, I guess you want to call it a, a cultural anthropological explanation. 
So someone's writing in uh, a newspaper about what Chinese in Tennessee are like. And they're sort of trying to give explanation to uh, people who live in Tennessee. What can you expect from Chinese? What, are, what is their character like? What are their personalities like? So this is almost kind of comical in a way. It says, uh, a Chinaman is almost as versatile as a Yankee. He can make wooden clocks and wooden, uh, what is that, for the mailer. Um, he is an excellent farmer, shoemaker, can make brick without straw, build houses and railroads, play poker, keep a hotel, wash and iron, nurse the baby, uh, edit a newspaper, run for Congress, and play the piano and entertain company. and goes on and on in this vein. So it's kind of hysterical to read this. But this is what was like being disseminated to uh, people in Tennessee. So, so like, hey, these Chinese are coming. This is what you're going to get. OK, go ahead. Uh, so that was this proposal, 1869, to bring 500 Chinese. So these are little clippings from headlines in the local newspaper. Uh, it was very common before the term chink arose to call him John Chinaman. John Chinaman was a little more of a neutral term. It was generic. Sometimes it was used in a negative way, sometimes it was used in a positive way. But it's just that they didn't know the names and they couldn't pronounce those complicated Chinese names. So we'll just call them all John Chinaman to represent, uh, you know, just like Sam Lee as opposed to, uh, I mean, not, not oh, I mean, Uncle Sam, sorry, in the wrong culture. Uncle Sam is supposed to represent the United States. Okay, so we got China, John Chinaman. Okay, now that's actually showing that the vote to bring those Chinese to work on the plantations didn't go through. They actually got defeated uh, in this newspaper article and actually published in, uh, well, it was reproduced in Clarksdale newspaper. It was probably a syndicated type of thing like Associated Press. Okay, next slide. So the man who brought, who, who brought this proposal, he actually also brought lots of Chinese to work on the railroad, Cornelius Koopmanshop, which is a, a, a Dutch name. Uh, he actually invested a lot of money bringing Chinese, like he brought some to Alabama even. And, uh, but eventually he came under hard times, like uh, some of his uh, arrangements didn't work out. Some of the uh, workers were not being paid by their employers and everything. And I think he may have filed for bankruptcy eventually. So it's kind of an interesting footnote that this man who was actually pretty influential as a contractor in the, you know, mid to late uh, 1800s bringing Chinese over uh, had that outcome. Uh, next slide. Now, what are these Chinese going to do? As I said before, uh, even in the South, uh, well, at least in Memphis, maybe not so much down in the Delta, um, they turned to running laundries. And it's not because that was their first choice by any means. It was by default that was what was available to them. So uh, next. Now, here are some ads from the Memphis newspaper as early as 1873 about Chinese laundries. And I, I, I know you can't read it in the back, and I won't try to read it to you. It's just basically saying, you know, we've opened a laundry on such and such street. Your business is appreciated. I was really intrigued by it. A lot of these uh, ads uh, had a little bit of uh, Yankee ingenuity to it. They weren't uh, cut and dry. They, some of them had some really interesting humor in them. Uh, next slide. And it got good press. So like one article in the newspaper said, uh, this was like an announcement. A Chinese laundry is the latest thing in Memphis. <laughs> hey, boy, we're really moving up in Memphis here. As washers, starchers, and ironers, the celestial, because Chinese would call celestials before they would call chinks, the celestial children beat the civilized world. Now, is that a compliment or, or not? Uh, and someone else over there talking about uh, the Chinese laundry is going to give satisfaction to those of our citizens who have been robbed and swindled by the washerwomen of the period, which was a derogatory comment against the black washerwomen. But, so they were saying the Chinese laundry was going to be a big success. So they you know, were trying to promote it. Okay, next. Uh, and here's another thing. In uh, 1874, they found that there were at least 12 laundries. There were 50 Chinese living in Memphis then, and all of them were involved in laundry. They, there was nothing else. Uh, so, uh, go ahead, next. Uh, now, go a year or two later, uh, well, a few years more later, 1885, uh, just another ad that said, uh, Chinese laundries are growing with wonderful rapidity in southern cities. That's how they said it. 
or over there it's like a plug for laundries in this warm weather it's well to know the location of a first class laundry and they're referring to in Memphis there's one called uh, I don't know why they called it the New York unless it meant that the man who ran it came originally from New York but at 411 Main Street is one of the places where the best work is done prices are low orders receive prime attention okay 1891 a few years later there's two dozen listed in the city directory for Memphis who are running laundries okay next uh, 1900 is 12 and on a sad note I put on the other side just one illustration again of the violence directed toward a lot of Chinese merchants whether they were laundries restaurants grocery stores that a lot of them were robbed uh, attacked and even killed uh, by uh, people who uh, had animosity toward them uh, next now eventually laundries uh, faced more competition from white steam laundries and also it became a market and interest in Chinese restaurants and so uh, gradually around the 1910s 1920s around that period more and more Chinese immigrants started opening restaurants as an alternative to running laundries or some did both so this little drawing sort of shows Chinese entering the building and some leaving the ones that are leaving have a seem to have a bag of laundry over their shoulders and the ones going on the right maybe they're bringing food and if you can see in the back you can see someone has superimposed a chop suey sign over the sign hand laundry okay so that meant they maybe didn't have to build a new sign just paint over the old one I don't know okay so next slide now chop suey was the ticket that was what sold the American public on Chinese restaurants because prior to the discovery of chop or this invention of chop suey most Americans thought Chinese ate rats cats and dogs maybe not necessarily in that order but in any case if you look carefully every one of those pictures has got a chop suey sign buried in them somewhere okay and this is just a sample I have a, probably another two or three dozen of them uh, in the 1920s 1930s Chinese restaurants didn't even bother putting their name up all they had to do was put up chop suey and that was it you know and they they got sufficient business okay next slide uh, this is referring to restaurants in Memphis uh, I don't know if any of you are old enough to have known uh, some of these restaurants uh, but in any case this is an article in your local newspaper about a problem where there was a scandal a very successful uh, restaurant owner a Wong cop who ran the uh, Shanghai restaurant on Hernando near Bill and later opened the Mandarin but then apparently he was caught selling uh, cocaine or opium rather uh, on the how well, they call it illegal narcotics but I'm probably pretty sure it's probably opium uh, so next and then uh, he went to jail and another man Lam Soon took over that Mandarin restaurant which of course I don't think exists anymore but and there's a sketch of a, a, a trading card for his restaurant and there was another restaurant uh, on 3rd Street so those were the beginnings of the uh, transition from doing laundry businesses to moving into other activities such as uh, restaurants and grocery stores uh, next slide now here's a picture of before and after um, on the left is the remnant of the chop suey restaurant at 342 Bill Street I understand it closed in 1960 uh, the picture uh, of the building is actually 1972 and this is an interesting quirk of doing research how do we know this picture was taken in 1972 because the movie theater down the street is showing Bruce Lee in the Chinese connection and if you look up uh, you know some database you'll find that movie came out in 1972 now how did I find <laughs> this picture this is kind of interesting so when I knew I was going to talk about Memphis and I didn't have many pictures about Memphis I discovered Memphis library had an archive digital archive so I said what the hell I just plug in Chinese and to the database and up comes this picture and at first I'm looking at this and I said oh there's a chop suey restaurant there oh that's what I'm looking for how did I find that if I plugged in a tag chop suey it wouldn't have come up I plugged in the word Chinese and the word Chinese came up because whoever tagged this said Chinese connection 
So thank you, Bruce Lee, for helping me find this picture of uh, Chop Suey Restaurant. And on the right-hand side is the best I could get from Google Maps of the way that area looks right now. Uh, turns out that was actually another Chinese restaurant on the other side of the street. I'll come to that in a minute, but okay. So next. Uh, that was the, the man who took over uh, the, the restaurant, uh, the Mandarin Inn, I was very active in uh, the 1940s in trying to raise money to, for the war effort for China against Japan. And this was true in a lot of big, country, big cities in the United States. They'd have fund drive, uh, United, uh, United China Relief, who was trying to activate uh, uh, contributions from Chinese immigrants in the United States to help China. So the Mandarin Inn had this chip in for China uh, party. They, you know, they would have a benefit to raise money. Uh, next slide. So Lam Soon, uh, who was the owner of that, uh, took over the ownership of the Mandarin restaurant. Here are a couple of news articles about him and his wife uh, and, and his son in this photograph uh, that were instrumental in this uh, endeavor. Next. Uh, and then, um, I recently, by chance, happened to be in communication with John Lee, who is from Memphis, and uh, his uncle, and uh, his, you are his uncle. Right, okay. I just met Bill Lee, his uncle, today. He introduced me, so it's really a small world kind of thing. Uh, so he contacted me and, uh, through communication. He, he shared these pictures with me of his grandfather, Paul Lee Sr., uh, and there he is uh, with one of those uh, flying tiger uh, planes. You know, I, he was a mechanic, so I, I assume he was in Burma at the time uh, at the uh, fabled uh, flying tigers. Um, oh, okay, thank you. All right, so there is that connection. And then afterwards, uh, next slide, he uh, had a couple of, uh, this is like the second location. I, I said several markets, but I, it really meant two, two market locations. So this was his, uh, Paul's uh, food store uh, in Memphis. And actually, uh, I was provided a list of other grocery stores uh, in Memphis that were opening, but I somehow forgot to include it. So I apologize to any grocery store owners and descendants. But that certainly became a very, uh, prevalent occupation, especially as we go further down into the Delta, but even in Memphis. Okay, next slide. So here we see Bill Street, as it, I guess, appeared fairly recently. Next. And uh, you can't see this, but the bottom one talks about the Willie Cafe, at, and it's a Chinese restaurant. It's got Chinese characters by it. It's at 343 Bill Street. So. Ch Chop Suey uh, Cafe was on the one side of the street, 342, and at 343, which would I assume be directly opposite that, was called the Willie Cafe, but apparently no one remembers it. So well, maybe you need a name like Chop Suey to remember a Chinese restaurant. Anyway, uh, that's a list from 1948 of Chinese businesses in America, and that's the one for Memphis. It's not a complete list because not all the stores got listed. But we see that there was a Chinese presence uh, of at least two restaurants on Beale Street. Okay, next slide. And of course, the uh, Family Association or the uh, uh, Benevolent Societies that the Chinese created all around uh, the country in big cities to help immigrants with their immigration, with their correspondence, uh, with relatives back in China, with sending remittances back to China, any of those types of problems. These were probably too much for the, you know, the average person to handle. So it was very important to have organizations like this, uh, which this is the Memphis chapter. I'm sure there's one in San Francisco as well, and maybe in Los Angeles, I'm not absolutely sure. But this was a, a picture of the building, uh, probably, uh, I don't know what it's like now, or whether it's even still there or not, 1940s or something. All right, so that's an important part of Memphis Chinese history, because without the support of the community of, of the Chinese with each other, you know, it would have been very difficult for them to survive. All right, next. So that's the, the start marker. I was also sent some photographs of your First Baptist Church. I, 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 you know, I can't identify the people, but some of them you uh, are probably 
um, involved with this church. Uh, but it showed the um, influence of Christianity and uh, religion of the, you know, especially of the uh, Deep South and, and how the Chinese interfaced with it and how they became incorporated with it. Next slide. And here are some other photographs of some of the people who were involved um, with the with the church and church activities and s parties and weddings and so forth. Now, next uh, from Elmwood Cemetery, uh, Chinese were not allowed to be buried with the white cemeteries in the white cemeteries for a long, long time. I mean, obviously that changed over time, but the early Chinese who who uh, were buried in Memphis. They had a, I guess we call it the section, the Chinese section of the Elman Cemetery. Uh, I know that uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, it's the same thing. There's a section of a cemetery where the Chinese were allowed to be buried, but not in other parts. And in fact, um, other Chinese who died in other places distant from Atlanta would, would ask to be buried there. I don't know what, about Elmwood, but I know like there was one Chinese who died in Chattanooga, and he wanted expressly to be buried in Atlanta because he wanted to be with other Chinese. So it was a, sort of a choice uh, enforced on them. So uh, here are some headstones from uh, Elmwood. And next, here are three generations from the Lamb family, which uh, I described to you earlier with the Mandarin restaurant. Uh, Ed Soon, who uh, lives in Sacramento, California now, he sent me these. Uh, one is his grandfather, one is his father, and one of his brother. Um, they're all in, interred in um, Elmwood. Uh, next. Now, um, I've given a lot of different talks in different parts of the country about one of my books or whatever, and something unusual always kind of happens. I finished a talk once, and this guy jumps up all excited. He says, uh, what do you know about Mississippi Chinese? <laughs> I don't know anything about Mississippi Chinese. Uh, he said, well, you really need to write a book about Mississippi Chinese. <laughs> and I don't know if I rolled my eyes or not, but I thought to myself, well, it takes a lot more work than just to get the idea, you know. <laughs> but he reassured me. He said, I will give you a lot of contacts. I have relatives in the Delta, and uh, my uh, aunt, uh, Carolyn Chan, is a, a big um, shot in the uh, uh, CACA, Chinese American Benevolent Association. So anyway, long story short, uh, I started interviewing people and talking to people uh, and found, yeah, you know, this is much more interesting than I thought it would be. And um, I thought it was really um, fortuitous that I was uh, directed toward this because this was a um, living, breathing, dynamic community, but it was fast shrinking, you know, due to age and, and and deaths and people moving away. So um, it was a real challenge to do it, but I found it, it's been very rewarding and I'm amazed how many people are amazed. In other words, they come and say, gee, we didn't know there were any Chinese in Mississippi. How did you find them? Uh, and oh, you know, this is something we want to hear more about. So like Mississippi Chinese are really a popular height item on the history circuit right now. Partly because it's almost like a discovery. Okay, next. Uh, so, as many of you know, I'm not going to go in great detail because I'm sure a lot of you know more about this than I do. Uh, Chinese in the Mississippi Delta, down around Greenville and Clarksdale and Cleveland, many of them had family run, small, small or medium sized mom and pop uh, grocery stores. Um, they were not like your big supermarkets. Uh, you know, this was back in the old day before they probably even had shopping carts. And um, the families worked together. The children contributed. They all had to work. And just as the children in laundries and restaurants had to work and help the family. And almost, I'd say 99% of the Chinese that I know who grew up in these places resented it at some time or other and wished they didn't have to do this. But then later, afterwards, they thought back on it and said, you know, this is actually, I learned a lot. You know, I, built, I, I learned a lot of discipline. I learned how to deal with people. I dealt with customers, you know, and, and so I feel really proud of my heritage. And this is certainly true uh, with the Mississippi Delta Chinese uh, grocery families. Uh, next slide. 
So you can see that all these pictures usually have family members in some form or other uh, contributing to the, to the grocery stores. Um, now, you know, there are a lot fewer and there probably aren't going to be any new ones uh, coming online uh, next. Um, that's just another, that's a big family. I don't know who's, which family that is. Maybe some of you recognize these people and can tell me. Uh, next. So in 2008, when I was down in uh, Mississippi and we went around Greenville looking at shells of old buildings, uh, two grocery stores, the uh, Joe Gao Number no. 2 and the uh, Mijon, Mijon uh, grocery store, I actually went out on a rainy, drizzly, foggy day searching for these buildings and staring at them and saying, is that the right building? Especially the one on the left. You know, I stared and stared at Joe Gowden number two until I convinced myself that that was the same building and had to get the right angle to take the picture. So this is a sign of the changing time. The history is fading right before our very eyes right there. And I was saying to them, they should get on one of these buildings on the National Register of Historic Buildings or something because there won't be any more of these before too long. Okay, next slide. So probably the most famous incident or case uh, dealing with the Mississippi Chinese that most uh, of the country might ever hear about is the Gong Lung uh, v. Rice 1928 Supreme Court decision. In Rosedale, uh, Mississippi, um, two Chinese girls, uh, well actually one, there were two, two sisters going to school, but the case really involved one of them uh, because she was used as the plaintiff. Uh, they were not allowed to go to the white school in Rosedale. And so they took the case to the state Supreme Court and they won, but then it was overturned. Then they took it to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court sided with the state of Mississippi and said that these children could not go to the white school. And it's written up in an excellent book called Waters Breaking uh, Boulders or something uh, by Adrian Berard. And uh, it's an excellent uh, read if you're interested in this topic. Uh, the family eventually then just moved across the river to Arkansas where they were allowed to go to white school. Now as a footnote on this, I was giving a talk about this once and, and uh, at the end a woman raised her hand and said, Oh, you know that woman that you were talking about who didn't get to go to that school? That's my aunt. And she caught me so by surprise. I was so stunned. I didn't even know what to say. I didn't even ask her, well, what's your name? And how do I get in touch with you? And then afterwards, I was kicking myself. I said, gee, I should have gotten her name so I could ask her for more details. So then about two months later, I saw her at another meeting. I went out and said, what's your name? What's your address? Tell me more about this. So it's a fascinating part of history. So those are just a few news clippings about that case in Rosedale. Uh, next slide. So that's what led me to write this book, uh, Chopsticks in the Land of Cotton, which is basically about the Mississippi Delta uh, Chinese grocery families. Uh, I changed the cover of it more recently to put chopsticks on it. Originally there were going to be chopsticks on it, but, uh, but then I kind of got worried that it would be too stereotypical. So I, I mixed the chopsticks. And then uh, I had second thoughts later, and so I put the chopsticks back on. <laughs> uh, next. Um, so to kind of summarize a little bit, you know, compared to certainly when I was a kid growing up and not even knowing what it meant to be Chinese and then finding out it really wasn't kind of a, a good thing in terms of the eyes of the American public in general, uh, We've got uh, Chinese Americans doing all these things that we would have never dreamed of, you know, 50 years ago. And we have even one being considered as a candidate for president. So that's, that's pretty remarkable. So, but before we, you know, get completely complacent about this, uh, next slide. Um, we still have room for improvement. There's still some problems. There's still times, you know, when we uh, get uh, ridiculed or condemned. Um, especially as we're having problems with China and the U.S. relations, that Chinese Americans, even if they're born in China, somehow the public thinks that genetically we're going to think the same way that they do in China, and that, that we have greater allegiance to China even though we weren't born there, and even if we went there they would see us as Americans, that nonetheless uh, we're sort of seen as quote unquote forever foreign. And one illustration of this that I always use is next. 
This is in 1998 at the Olympics um, when Michelle Kwan uh, failed to win. He, she was favored. She failed to win first prize, uh, first place. So the headline said, "American beats out Kwan." Uh, uh, Michelle Kwan was uh, born in Torrance, which is in California, which is in the United States, and so I think that qualifies her as being an American. So the headlines could have been "American beats out American," but no. Anyway, and then of course we have uh, Jeremy Lin, who now is now gone to China. But in any case, uh, there were these uh, headlines a few years ago referring to his rise to sudden fa but short-lived fame as "chink in the armor." Okay, so those are just symptomatic of how um, Chinese still have, there's still this residue of that you know maybe we're not really American or fully American. Next, so. What I've been trying to do uh, as, as, a, as this uh, retirement career has developed is uh, try to figure out w what's the best use of my, uh, my time in terms of disseminating this information. So a lot of my early talks around the country have been to older audiences, uh, and that's fine, and that's good, but uh, it's like preaching to the choir to some extent. Uh, I'd talk to these older laundrymen, and they'd all be all excited, and I thought, I'm not telling these people anything they don't already know. So what's the big deal? You know, I, should, I don't need to feel proud about that. So I said, well, you know, we need to take to the younger generation. And actually in Memphis, in Memphis, they threw me a curveball at the last minute. I was on the plane to come here almost uh, the day before. And they said, could you talk to our fifth grade at the University of Memphis? And I thought, what? Are you kidding? I don't talk to fifth graders. I mean, they're too smart. Uh, <laughs> I only talk to old people, uh, <laughs> present company accepted. Uh, but they, they threw this challenge at me, and, and I, I, I took it. You know, Ten years earlier, I would have chickened out and said, I can't do it. But the older you get, the braver you get. I said, yeah, let's go for it. And uh, I think I did a pretty good job. I, 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 and the reason I know this is uh, I showed them some poems of the immigrants from China uh, on Angel Island. They carved them on the walls. And these poems were quite poignant and bittersweet and talking about how badly they felt being, uh, you know, delayed uh, in their immigration and detained and sometimes deported. And at the end of the talk, one of these fifth grade boys raised his hand and said, where can I find those poems? And that really kind of blew me away. So I figured I at least had the interest of some of them. Uh, next. Now this is something interesting. I have a lot of these interesting things happen to me. A couple of years ago, I got this email from a fourth grade teacher, I think it was, in somewhere in California, and said, we're doing this project and we want to use some images from your father's immigration file. Can we have permission to do that? And I said, oh, sure, yeah, I'd be, I'd be honored. You know. So they went and put together a video. Uh, those of you who are hip, you know, know uh, Bruno Mars and his Uptown Funk. If you don't, uh, maybe we can see if we can get it to run. So they made a uh, version where they adjusted the lyrics. Yeah, if, it, if we can. Yeah, I guess we can hear it. Okay, cut. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant. I mean, I was really stoked when they said that to me. Uh, and I don't know if they ever said it to Bruno Mars or what he thought of it, but in any case, they capitalized. I, I guess they had to get his permission uh, to do that. Okay, uh, so just to kind of summarize a little bit, part of like why I do this, like um, I think it was kind of implied it was this is kind of an accidental retirement career. I had no uh, real 
a master plan to do this, but then one thing led to another. And so when I gave these talks, um, you can't see these comments, but these are some reactions I got from uh, older Chinese. Some of it has to do with sort of validation. Some of them felt like no one really uh, uh, gave them respect. And so r reading about it and seeing that someone was telling their stories, uh, I think was gratifying to them. So that in turn, that was gratifying to me. Uh, next slide. Um, so I included a few comments from some people who were, I guess you'd say, the younger generation, like what they got out of it, like they were sort of saying they could really relate to some of the things that I talked about in Southern Fried Rice, that even though we were a generation apart, um, they uh, found it rewarding to uh, see uh, also some uh, facilitation of, of helping them uh, think about what their identity was. And then, uh, Last slide or next slide. So I've also, because I don't want to always be preaching to the choir, I've been trying to recruit more and more non-Asian audiences because it's important that they also, and a lot of them are very interested in it too, and, and so it would benefit them to know about it. So partly uh, that's one of my, my goals is in future talks to try to find more uh, people who don't know this history at all because here are just three quotes that I think are summarize why um, knowing our history is very important so that we don't repeat it. Um, and then uh, as your uh, Mississippian William Faulkner, the noted uh, writer, the past is not dead. In fact, it's not even past. So anyway, I thank you for your kind attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. John. I mean, I've been studying a lot of this history, keeping up with some of these new things that I've not been known about. And I've learned a lot just from listening to your lecture today, Dr. John. So, uh, but just to add to Dr. John's uh, discussion, the uh, Lung Kung Ting Yi, the picture that he showed earlier, we actually, the Historical Society actually erected a uh, marker. So that building is now the current Gibson Guitar Factory, which is now the mm. headquarters for FedEx. Oh. So we actually have a marker there now, and it just so happens that uh, the other picture that you showed of a large Chinese family in the grocery store, oh, yeah. Yeah. that is my Uncle Joe. All right, yeah, a small <laughs> world, yeah. Uncle, uh, he was one of the last uh, Chinese uh, businessmen uh, grocery stores on Beale Street. Uh -huh. So actually tomorrow we are actually commemorating and, uh, or dedicating a new marker to that. So we are actually then uh, is going to uh, highlight the Chop Suey Cafe. There's the Chop Suey again. So that was uh, one of the last and longest uh, open chi uh, Chinese restaurants on Beale Street. And we're also going to commemorate uh, a lot of the Chinese businesses, laundries again, and grocery stores. And uh, the uh, descendants of uh, uh, George G. will be there to help un unveil the, uh, the marker, and also the sons of Mr. Chi will also be there to dedicate the marker. So that's tomorrow at 2 o'clock at Henry Park. So we hope that everybody can come tomorrow to see that. We're also going to be invited the Joe Family Band, so we're going to actually have uh, traditional Chinese music. There's going to be arts and crafts there, so there'll be lanterns given out by the uh, Belts Museum. We're going to have Chinese calligraphy by the Confucius Institute of Memphis, the University of Memphis, as well as a Tai Chi sword dance. And also at the end of the dedication, and Jimmy Rout is going to help us dedicate that uh, marker as well. And at the very end, we're going to have a dragon dance, and then the dragon is going to lead us over to the marker where we'll have been unveiled. So hopefully, you can come back tomorrow. And also later on today, Jamoka, which is the uh, Greater Memphis United Chinese Association, is having a function at Shelby Farms at 5 o'clock, so that's just a few hours from now, at uh, the, uh, I guess it's called the Shelby Farms Visitor Center. And it's going to be outdoors, so you might want to bring a chair or something. It's going to be kind of sunny, so you to bring some sunglasses. They're going to serve some food. Uh, they're going to get a box sign for $10, and you can watch the performance there. And also today, I just found out yesterday that uh, at 8 o'clock at Crosstown Concourse, the Tibetan Mies are actually having a moon festival 
celebration as well. So that today we picked best today too. Okay. So well, I mean, uh, we picked the busiest weekend. I think everybody wants to do something this mm -hmm. weekend, I guess. Oh, but, good uh, weather in Florida. So we're still out of Dr. John Kutuk, time from his busy schedule to come and, and talk to us today too as well. So if you have any questions for him, be free to discuss this. Yeah, if anyone's interested in any of the books, I have a few copies of the bag. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is. It, uh, it, we got some extra, yes. Well, I have a question. You became a psychologist, and I'm a psychologist, so did you have difficulty getting into graduate school, or did you feel any prejudice there? No, I don't think so. I, I had no problems. Uh, I went to graduate school in uh, Northwestern um, University in the um, late 50s, early 60s, and... Uh, there weren't that many um, Asians or, or certainly Chinese Americans in that field at that time, but uh, there, there are plenty more now, but yeah. Other questions? Yes? There were, um, uh, there were quite a few Memphians that grew up like in China and the Presbyterian missionary groups. Uh, Mary Davis at St. Mary's, she originally in the Muirheads, mm. and uh, I was wondering if, if um, the uh, lady that was married to um, Chiang Kai-shek, if, if they were, if all three sisters were here, and if they, if they were tied somehow to that Presbyterian mission group of Billy Graham's wife, mm -hmm. she grew up, Pearl Buck, you know, right. all, they were a considerable number. Yeah, um, well the three sisters were in Macon like around 1910, give or take a couple of years. Uh, Maylene was the youngest of them. Um, so the two older ones were in college in Georgia and then Maylene was in elementary school. And then she later went to Wellesley up in Massachusetts. But um, they didn't come over so much as uh, brought over by missionaries. It was that their father uh, had a degree in divinity and he knew uh, missionaries in the South who I guess became like foster parents or they were wards of his. They, um, he looked after them while they were there. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, um, a lot of Baptist uh, missionaries went to China and had some influence on uh, bringing some Chinese over, although it was tough going in the early days because the missionaries didn't really succeed very well. There was a lot of resistance and uh, they weren't converting too many people because it was just uh, too to, to, well, I won't use the word foreign, but uh, you know, Chinese had their own beliefs and stuff. So uh, there was a quote from somebody in Mississippi saying, hey, why are we going to China to try to convert the Chinese? We got some right here. <laughs> and they, they, they did do a lot of conversion in the Delta by reaching out and providing community services, uh, helping teach English to um, the Chinese, uh, providing uh, maybe some forms of child care or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>